Happy Friday, everyone. And thanks for joining us today for the Windbreaks, Shelter Belts, and Field Borders webinar. And this is Penny Poley, and I am the Conservation Training and Membership Services Manager at Wisconsin Land and Water. And today our presenters are Shannon Rohde from the Central Wisconsin Windshed Partnership, Katie Adams from the Savannah Institute, and Andy Hart from NRCS. Um, I think that's about it. I'm going to turn it over to Shannon. Are you ready, Shannon? I am ready. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, awesome. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as Penny says, my name is uh, Shannon Rohde, and I am the project manager of the uh, Central Wisconsin Windshed Partnership Group. We are based out of the Hancock Egg Research Station, so that's why I'm calling in this morning. Um, based a little bit of background about me, I was born and raised on a dairy farm in Clark County. I went to Stevens Point, UWSP, um, for college. I graduated with a um, resource management degree. That was my uh, that was my major, which is a general resource management with a soils, uh, geology, and natural science um, minors. Uh, my first position. Working in my field, actually I did a, a limited term job working for the Door County Soil and Water Department. I was up there for five months from July of 02 to about Christmas time of 02. And then I took over as the project manager of the Windshed Program back in February 3rd of 03. So I've been here a little over 17 years. So anyway, so yeah, I'm gonna give a little update, uh, a little presentation on the Windshed, what we do, services that we offer, and then I believe I'm going to be passing it, um, uh, passing it on. So I will start um, if Katie wants to head to the next slide. I am, so just a little bit of a history on the windshed. Uh, so this is a program that uh, started kind of in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, it was based uh, through the Portage County LCC uh, and they were petitioned by the citizens in the town of Stockton and uh, some of the surrounding areas to act on controlling some of the wind erosion um, problem that they were having. Basically what happened is a lot of people started coming in and clearing a lot of the trees. Um, obviously we know that central Wisconsin is very flat, it's very sandy soil, uh, really opened up a lot of the ground and the, obviously the wind keeps blowing and really started blowing a lot of the, a lot of the dust around and uh, really kind of started becoming a, a big problem um, around the central Wisconsin area. So. Basically, a series of educational and, and policy meetings were conducted by Portage County LCC. Uh, they're kind of held in the towns of uh, Stockton, Buena Vista, and the Plover uh, with representatives from that area, some of the growers, uh, some of the government, and some of the local citizens. And basically what happened is in March of 90, uh, 1988, uh, a wind erosion conference took place to, uh, to gather some of the people in the Golden Sands to kind of formulate some sort of an action plan on how they were going to control the wind erosion problem. Uh, so from these people, a committee was formed and they uh, basically developed um, a detailed uh, program designed an organizational structure. Uh, and this was just called the Wind Erosion Control Project. And it was actually originally administered through the Golden Sand RCD. So it started off as a very small kind of a little pilot project uh, and how it all started. So um, on to the next slide. Um, yeah, in, uh, in 89, um, the Wisconsin uh, Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection, uh, also known as DADCAP, uh, and through the Soil and Water uh, Resource Management uh, Funds, they basically allocated monies to the r and for a wind erosion control specialist. And in uh, 1990, representatives developed uh, this bill to fund, uh, to fund this project for four years. It eventually passed, and uh, it actually received a one-year extension through 95. Uh, but the program was originally, uh, you know, just called the Central uh, Central Sands Wind Erosion Control Pilot Project, uh, and it used a combination of um, conservation tax credits, conservation tillage demos, educational programs, and uh, to, to kind of encourage this wind erosion control. So uh, during the early 90s, you know, 94, 95, there was uh, 10 different windbreak demonstration plantings that were um, established on area farms. And um, that, that's kind of how the, uh, how the whole uh, whole program started. Um, so next uh, next slide, Katie. And uh, in '95, uh, a conference was kind of held 
to kind of evaluate the whole pro, uh, project to kind of determine if this was going to be really needed and uh, it was, uh, you know, if there was going to be a design in kind of the future and where this program was going to head, uh, it was uh, felt that it was a very effective in getting growers to increase their use of conservation tillage, cover crops, windbreaks, some sort of, uh, you know, vegetative strips to kind of control this uh, wind erosion. And uh, the area growers, processor, landowners, citizens, uh, you know, different government organizations, um, they kind of recognized a, a need, uh, a need for this program. So it kind of all formed um, the Central Wisconsin Windshed Partnership, um, which is now actually called the Central Wisconsin Windshed Partnership Group. Um, so that's kind of how it all got started. So next slide. So as I mentioned before, um, the office is based out of the uh, Hancock Egg Research Station. Uh, the program is actually administered through the Portage County um, Land and Water Conservation Planning and Zoning Department. So that's technically who I'm employed by. Um, but our office is down at the research station, just a nice centrally uh, located area because we work all over central Wisconsin. And so currently I am the project coordinator and before I had started, uh, there was actually a, a windbreak specialist and then also a conservation tillage specialist. And uh, now it's all kind of got combined into one project coordinator, which is the position that I have now. So next slide. Um, so who we are, so we're the partners of the windshed. So, you know, with the Wisconsin Potato and Vegetable Growers Association, uh, the WPBJ, uh, and then the Land Conservation Committees of Adams, Juneau, Portage, Wilshire, and Wood Counties. Um, but we're also working with other counties like Green Lake, uh, La Crosse, Langlade, Lincoln, Marathon, Marquette, Wapaka. Uh, we've really kind of expanded into quite a few different counties around around the central Wisconsin uh, area. Um, obviously, I mentioned before, uh, uh, DADCAP, uh, the vegetable processing industry, we're, we're all working with. Uh, next slide, Katie. And uh, obviously, the local growers, uh, we're working with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS. Um, obviously, the Hancock Egg Research Station, the, uh, the Golden Sands RCND. Um, so with uh, next slide, Katie. With uh, RCND, that's actually who when I hire um, interns uh, or, or limited term employees to help me out during the season, they're actually hired through the Golden Sands RCND. So we got a pretty good working relationship uh, with them as well. So a little bit of what we do, uh, we basically assist growers in and uh, in other areas to try to control the wind erosion um, and you know the blowing snow, blowing sand. Um, the plantings that we do can obviously be wildlife habitat enhancements. Um, we'll basically do it through three different uh, primary activities. And so what we do is we offer a, a full service windbreak, living snow fence, kind of established and maintenance program. We also do some wildlife habitat development. And then basically it's just a lot of information and education uh, to growers and local landowners on how to control wind erosion and uh, reduce blowing snow um, over some of the highways and, and, and state roads and stuff like that. So. Uh, next slide. So here are some of the services that we offer. Uh, so we basically have a, a free technical assistance and design um, and plant selection. We do different site preparation. Um, and we obviously come in and plant the trees. And we have a very unique machine that installs this fabric uh, weed barrier over the top of our, our trees, which you'll kind of see in, uh, in some upcoming slides. So with the tree plantings, well, we uh, looking at tree windbreaks, if we plant a double row of trees, it's usually the most common planting that we do is a, is a two row. Um, if it's a two rows of trees, the spacing that we use is an eight foot by eight foot spacing. So basically the rows are spaced eight feet apart. And then in between the trees in the row, they're spaced eight feet apart as well. If we do more of a, a shrub wind break, so if you're looking at an area where we might be dealing with power lines or irrigation systems, we might um, do a double row of shrub wind break, something that doesn't grow is high. Those spacings are six foot between the rows, and then we space them, uh, the shrubs four feet between, uh, between the shrubs in the row. Um, so these are uh, kind of some, actually, uh, it's kind of an old picture, but this is kind of the, uh, the setup of our tree planter. Um, it's basically a two seat tree planter with a guy sitting on it. Um, when we're planting the trees, usually one of the guys has one of the species. 
uh, another guy is another species if we are doing an alternating species in the row and then each guy drops them in alternating them in the row so it's kind of uh, a nice setup with uh, having a two seat uh, tree planter next slide so the fabric weed barrier um, the windshed started using this back in 1997 and it dramatically increased the survival rate of our stock that we planted. So basically what it is is a 15 mil uh, woven polypropylene fabric. Um, it, you know, it allows the moisture to come through it, but it also retains moisture, you know, under the fabric. Now, obviously, if we have a, a year like 2012 when it was really hot, really dry, we didn't have a lot of moisture. It doesn't really retain moisture when there's not moisture. But um, that fabric also has a rough span of, you know, roughly 10 to 15 years um, before it eventually deteriorates into the soil but i also do have projects that have been around even longer than that and you can still see the fabric that's uh that's out there so next slide so we have two different uh two different setups with the fabric um if we are planting two rows of trees with their space eight feet apart we use a six foot wide uh fabric and if we're doing the, the two rows of shrubs that are only spaced six feet apart and then we have a fabric machine that uh, installs one 10 foot roll of fabric over both um, both rows at the same time and um, we also have done different hand planting where we're kind of filling in some different windbreaks to thicken it up and uh, we have a, a three foot by three foot fabric square that we use um, for situations like that so so this is kind of a setup of our fabric layer this is actually an old picture the the design has been redone a little bit um, but as you can see, there's a display on the front. Um, so on each side, basically what happens is it opens a furrow on each side uh, of the fa uh, of the rows of trees. There's a guy that's um, right now it's actually on a seat instead of that board. But there's a guy sitting on that machine that rides right over those fabric um, on, on the fabric where the where the trees are, and that roll kind of rolls over a seedling because we're only planting small, young, you know, one to two foot size seedlings. So the fabric rolls right over that. And there's a guy sitting on there that can kind of see where that tree roll goes under the fabric layer and, and cuts a little slot. And those wheels you can kind of see in that machine press the edges of that fabric in that uh, little furrow that those front blades created. And then the back blades you can see basically takes the dirt, folds it back over, and kind of seals everything in. So it's kind of a neat, uh, kind of a neat machine. It's kind of a neat process and how that works. I believe the next couple pictures are kind of us in action. So there's us um, working, covering uh, two rows of shrubs. You can see the 10 foot wide piece of fabric um, being installed with the guy sitting on the machine, cutting the slots um, when the uh, fabric goes over the shrubs. And then there'll be somebody walking behind, um, which we'll see in the next couple slides, that basically um, they'll walk behind and cut the slot open and um, uh, staple it down and, and then you'll have the finished product. But this the, this picture here is a demonstration of the six foot. If you want to jump back real quick, Katie, sorry. So this is uh, the six foot machine. This, uh, this was actually a demonstration um, that we did in Washer County a few years ago, um, showing how the six foot fabric works uh, with that machine. So very similar setup, just one to six foot and one to 10 foot. So you can go to the next slide now. So yeah, as I said, you have a guy walking behind that cuts the fabric slot open, pulls the tree through, and then he staples uh, staples the fabric down to keep it from flopping in the wind, which could just damage the tree. And then the next slide uh, kind of shows how it uh, will look when it's done. So there was an example that we did with a, a small young uh, pine tree, uh, and that's kind of how the fabric uh, weed barrier works. It's kind of a kind of an interesting machine. I know a lot of people have seen. You know trees being planted but there's not a lot of people that have seen how the fabric layer works so it's kind of a kind of an interesting machine and interesting setup and how that works uh, so next slide uh, so yeah so these next couple um, well, slides here just a couple examples this was one of the windbreaks that we did down through the middle of a field um, quite a few years ago next slide please <clears throat> so this was a double row of shrubs that we did um, that's how it looks with the with the ten foot fabric over it. Um, that sign that you see there, that windbreak planting sign, that's something to kind of identify our projects. Uh, it actually has our 800 number on it. Our new signs have our 800 number on it. So if someone would be driving around and happen to see this, um, I've actually gotten calls before where they said they happened to get out, look at, and they saw our sign, 
saw the number on it, called her office and said, hey, what is this? You know, what's this program? What do you guys do? Um, I'm interested in doing something this like my, myself. So um, on the next picture, we have basically the same uh, project, just uh, quite a few years um, after that and how it's growing up really nice and thick. Uh, again, on this one, I know we did a double row of shrubs because it was down through the middle of a field so the irrigation systems can go over it no problem and doesn't cause any um, any problem with the irrigation system. I believe the next slide now is a, this is an example of the double row of trees, obviously spaced a little bit farther apart and then in, installed with the two rows of fabric over it. And I believe the next slide is uh, the same windbreak, just a few years, you know, a few years older with our, our D sign. Um, uh, there. So, next slide. Uh, this was a, a you know a windbreak that we did quite a few years ago. Uh, again, this was a, a double row tree windbreak, um, more of a mature, established, established windbreak along the edge of a, a field. Kind of, I, I, I see our ID sign there, kind of buried under there. Next slide. So, so this is some of the services that we offer. So we. Um, any plantings that we do, we offer a three-year service, um, basically a maintenance. And basically what we're doing is we're kind of babysitting these trees. You know, we're replacing um, any dead or missing trees. We hand weed around every single tree or shrub that we plant. Um, we have done uh, some pruning in the past. Uh, we don't do a ton of pruning, but we've ha we have done sun, um, with, with some with some of the tops of the trees or shrubs that die off. And then we also mow around the edges of the fabric to keep like wild buckwheat and vetch and some of that stuff knocked down um, because that stuff can kind of grow and creep on and wrap itself around our, our plants and can, can eventually suffocate them. So we keep the, you know, they keep the edges mowed nice and clean and it just looks really uh, a lot nicer too when things are mowed. Um, but that's what we do with our, 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 uh, our maintenance program. So these are the types of plantings. Uh, we do basically field perimeter windbreaks. We do interior field shrub wind breaks. Uh, shrub, for example, if we are dealing with some sort of a irrigation system, um, farmstead, livestock shelter belts. We've been doing a lot of living snow fences lately, um, some wildlife plantings, or as I mentioned before, we do a, a wind break renovation where we might go in, kind of hand plant, fill in some of those uh, thinner areas, and then you know then put down those three foot uh, by three foot fabric squares. Next slide. So the plantings that we do, um, there can be cost sharing money available, uh, and in most situations, there's a 70% cost sharing uh, that is um, available for landowners to get through the land conservation departments. Um, so the windshed basically puts the programs together. Obviously, not every program um, is guaranteed cost share money, right? That's determined through the land conservation departments. Um, but the, if you're going through the soil and water cost sharing rate. Um, and we also do, um, next slide, uh, we do, yeah, so we do offer, um, yeah, so there's basically two different programs. The Land Conservation Department, like I mentioned, offers 70%, and uh, we also have done some cost sharing through the NRCS, uh, and I believe they just pl uh, provide a flat rate, and I don't actually know what that flat rate is this year. Um, that's why I just left that blank. But through their um, equip funds, there's uh, cost share uh, money is available as well for these programs. So th this was just um, this next picture is just an example of I had. I had a farmer send me this. This is up around the Stevens Point area. This was during the middle of the winter when we didn't have a lot of uh, snow one time, and the wind started blowing, and this this farmer just got blasted by this uh, this dust bowl and. Yeah, if any of you guys have driven around in central Wisconsin on a very windy, you know, maybe early spring before the crops have really established or in the late fall um, after the crops have come off, you maybe have driven through some of these, you know, wind erosion events when the dust is blowing around and it's really hard to see. So this was just one of the examples um, that we had. Actually, I think the next couple of pictures are, are pictures of that same, that same event. Um, and actually that landowner that sent me these, he said how the the dust actually was formulating in his house on the windowsill because of his windows were getting blasted so bad. So it's uh, it's definitely a problem still around central uh, Wisconsin, and we're just trying to trying to control that uh, that problem. It's, I think it's going to be almost impossible to prevent it, um, but as long as we can try to control it, that's uh, that's what we're looking for. So uh, next slide. So. 
that is really all I have through the through the windshed program and what we do and what we offer. I know Penny mentioned that we are going to do uh, more of a kind of a question and answer thing at the end of this. Uh, but this is my contact information. Uh, so we do have our toll free 800 number, uh, my email there and the website, uh, I kind of cut that off, but uh, we do have a website that can basically be found through the uh, Portage County uh, website. If you click on the, the department, go through the planning and zoning department, uh, there will be a link for the uh, Central Wisconsin Windshed Partnership um, group link, and that gives all of our information, um, our content information, what we do, with the services that we offer, uh, and everything like that. So um, with that, I will, I believe, pass it along to Katie. Thanks so much, Shannon. I really loved learning about well, that program. Hi everyone, thank you so much um, for having me on today. My name is Katie Adams and I'm the Illinois Demonstration Fire Manager for the Savannah Institute. Um, the Savannah Institute's a nonprofit organization based out of Madison, Wisconsin, even though I'm here in central Illinois presenting today. Um, and we're really focused on widespread agroforestry adoption throughout Wisconsin, Illinois, and the greater Midwest. Um, in addition to the work that I do with the Savannah Institute, I also do um, tree planting and shelter built and windbreak establishment as part of a for-profit company called Midwest Agroforestry Solutions. So we have a tree planter that's similar to, to the one that Shannon was talking about. And if you wanna see a picture of what I look like, I'm in the upper right-hand corner there after a pretty muddy tree planting day on the back of that tree planter. Um, I also manage a, a for-profit um, agroforestry farm in central Illinois um, called Saturn Farm, and we grow currants, uh, rhubarb, asparagus, chestnuts, hazelnuts, uh, black locusts for timber, and pawpaws in a alley cropping setting. So I mentioned that I manage demonstration farms throughout Illinois, and this year we're establishing three to really show um, agroforestry in action, including windbreaks and shelter belts. So at Fields Restored, as well as Sun Dappled, um, we have windbreaks already established at those, and we'll be hosting a variety of field days this season. So if you wanted to come out and see some of those, we'd love to have you. Um, just a little bit about the Savannah Institute before I get going even more. Uh, I mentioned that we're, we're really focused on scalable agroforestry um, and that we kind of take that mission into uh, three separate ways. So we really focus on tree crops. So what are the most productive and resilient tree crops for food and fodder? Um, how can we create really robust food uh, farming systems for uh, trees? for ecological resilience as well as economic resilience. And we're really focused on connecting stakeholders that include uh, farmers, landowners, and also folks in the community to help us do this work. So one of the main things that we do through our focus on agroforestry is we try to combine the natural world, the conservation world, and the agricultural world together through the practices that we research, the practices that we demonstrate, um, and the practices that we would like to see more widespread across the agricultural landscape. And windbreaks are a really great way to bring all three of those things together. So agroforestry in a nutshell is basically a set of five practices um, that are supported through the USDA as well as lots of different state and federal programs. Um, so forest farming, silvopasture, alley cropping, repairing, repairing forest buffers, and windbreaks. And all, th all of these practices combine uh, food for wildlife, food for humans, and have the ecological benefit that we're seeking to put back on the land. So we like to think of agroforestry as a toolkit. So using all of these practices um, to do a variety of, of tasks. And it all depends on your landscape and what the goals that you're looking to um, achieve there. So I'm just gonna run through these very quickly just to show what those practices look like. Um, alley cropping is the intentional intensive planting of trees into agricultural lands, um, either annual or perennial crops. Riparian buffers um, go along streamways or, or waterways, and we really focus on making those productive for both human and wildlife, as well as for the added benefit of uh, water quality. 
silvopasture, which is the integration of animals and trees together, either planting trees into fields or bringing livestock into wooded areas. Forest farming, um, which includes things like medicinal mushrooms, medicinal plants, um, even bringing animals into the landscape, uh, foraging, and really encouraging um, production for human use in forests. It's the original form of agriculture, and it's still practiced very widely around the world. And windbreaks, which is what we're here to talk about today. Um, the Zena Institute, as well as agroforestry, view windbreaks as, as vital spaces um, for ecological diversity, um, as well as diversity of crops for humans, um, with the benefit of also protecting croplands from wind erosion, water erosion, um, pollution and drift issues, as well as snow and shelter belts. So the reason we do all of this um, is to really start moving away from the conventional monocropping model, more towards a diversified model of agriculture that really seeks to capture nutrients through a constant living root in the soil, um, stabilize those soil structures and add to soil health, as well as to you know, break, put down a minimal pesticide, herbicide, and chemical usage, um, both from an environmental standpoint as well as from an ecological one because those things are expensive. But back to windbreaks. So um, when we approach farmers and landowners and folks about the possibility for windbreaks on their lands, we really ask them what they want to do with these windbreaks. So there's lots of different reasons why you would want to install a windbreak or a shelter belt or a living snow fence. Um, and different people have different reasons for that. Um, you know, we, the, the windbreaks that I have personally worked on designing and installing, you know, most folks are looking to control soil erosion, looking to keep water on their land so that can spread out and infiltrate into their crops, um, as well as to protect sensitive crops from, from drift issues. Um, I have, you know, talked with folks that are also interested in that uh, installing windbreaks for reducing odors from, from livestock operations or other things that are happening um, around their croplands and around their homesteads. So, you know, buffers have a variety of functions across the landscape, um, but the ones that we focus on um, through our agroforestry work is really biodiversity, so um, creating really supported wildlife habitats that restore connectivity to, to pollinator populations as well as wildlife populations, um, and also increase economic opportunities for farmers. So you can add diversified plantings of fruit and nut, as well as decorative things like uh, willows or or red stem dogwoods and to, to windbreaks and shelter belts, um, and also to, to make it beautiful. Um, they, in central Illinois, we don't have a lot of trees left on our landscape and a lot of shelter belts and windbreaks that were installed in the 40s and, and years on have now been ripped out. So we're looking to, to put some of those back in. Um, but you know, water quality, uh, productive soils and protection and safety cannot be overstated as well. So one of the biggest things that people come to me and say, oh, we should, you know, let's talk about adding trees to your landscapes. They're like, well, I can't do that because yields are gonna drop. If you take out some area to put some trees in, uh, no matter the ecological or economic benefit, we're just gonna lose yields. But as this kind of complicated diagram shows, here, you do, use, you do lose a little bit of yield right next to the tree, but in the, in the middle of your trees, your, your yield actually goes up. And it goes up to a, a, a pretty significant amount depending on the crop that you're, that you're protecting. Um, so for example, this is a, a figure from the National Agroforestry Center. When we install windbreaks, um, we can actually see up to a 12% yield increase in corn. Um, and that's taking you know, from, the, from the field square footage and acreage um, up to 25% increase in barley. Um, and this is because of the microclimates as well as the soil building and water retention that comes with installing windbreaks and, and shelter belts in those areas. Um, you know, some people are hesitant because, you know, trees, depending on what you choose, can spread into fields. Um, but with, you know, some cultural measures, you can really decrease those quote unquote risks that people might uh, find associated with, with windbreaks. And so root pruning is something that, that we've done to really make the roots go down 
deeper, um, farther than spreading out into fields, um, making sure that you're choosing the right trees and shrubs for your particular farm and your particular context. Um, harvesting fruit and crops within the windbreak can, can really help cut down on, you know, seed spreading and things of that nature and really focusing on the design. So what's your spacing, what's your number of rows, um, things of that nature. So some of the just key design considerations that, that we work with folks when we're designing windbreaks um, is really taking each one of these um, into consideration. So, you know, how, what height are you wanting to achieve in order, you know, to hit your goal of what you want to do with that windbreak? Um, how many trees and what's the spacing and orientation of that? How long um, is the windbreak going to be? Okay. Um, we, when we're looking at putting in a windbreak that, that meets like NRCS conservation practice standards, you know, your goal for the windbreak, it has, you know, different design options. Um, depending on that, and you have to hit certain criteria if you're going to to enroll in that program. Um, is your is your windbreak going to be the same across the landscape, or is it going to change as the landscape changes or the field use changes as well? Um, what does it look like from the from each angle, um, and how is the the wind and other elements going to run through that windbreak? And um, a big one is genetic choices. So what are you going to put in there and why like are you going to put you know more varieties and cultivars that produce uh, a saleable product or are you going to go with more native genetics that fit your landscape and really hit the goal if your goal is just protection um, or wildlife enhancement so for heightened density one of the things that you really need to pay attention to is how dense your planting is um, so that you can do some calculations for, for wind density, or I'm sorry, for, for wind speed and reducing that wind speed. So different trees um, have different functions within that. So if you're going for wind or going for snow or you're going for soil erosion, um, those planting densities can, can really serve the, the goals of the windbreak itself. So here's a pretty old sketch, um, but shows as a pretty good illustration of tree height um, and the direction the wind's going and how much protection you're going to get from each height of that tree. So in designing those wind breaks, knowing the height and knowing how much space you want to protect is, is really important. Um, the orientation of the wind break is also key. So we use a lot of um, wind rose data when we're designing uh, windbreaks and repairing buffers and different agroforestry plantings, because we wanna know which direction and how intense the wind is blowing at different parts of the year. So here's a wind rose from Champaign-Urbana where I'm based. Um, and as you can see, it changes throughout the year, but there are some constants. So we know that for the majority of the year, except in July when things are pretty calm, um, they're coming from the south. Um, and that's a pretty consistent um, wind direction and pretty consistent wind speed in there as well. But also, you know, except for July, we're also getting wind from the west. So designing that windbreak, if you're going to do, you know, just one strip or you might do a, um, an L-shaped windbreak to protect from both of those directions, or if you're a place where the wind is pretty unpredictable, um, then you might think about um, putting your windbreak in, uh, around your entire field if you have the, the resources and the option to do that. Um, here's some general basic guidelines um, for designing windbreaks that um, hit NRCS standards. So you'll notice that on the right-hand side, um, there's different, um, different codes. So this is actually a little different than what we have in Illinois. Um, for example, if I'm installing a windbreak for wildlife, it means you need to have at least two rows. One row must be an evergreen um, and one, and let's see, A, H, and then one row must be shrubs. So this is actually a little different than what the guidelines are currently in Illinois. Um, so in Illinois, if we're installing a windbreak for wildlife, um, we need five rows and one row must be an evergreen and one row must be a row of shrubs. So this really goes back to, to the goals of your planting 
um, what do you want to do and why do you want to do it? So I'm going to bring up some examples of some windbreaks that I have been a part of here in Illinois just to, to share my experiences. So this is a windbreak that we're currently designing with a landowner up in northern Illinois. Um, so on the left hand side, I'm sorry this is so small, I tried to make it better, um, is our design for that windbreak. So we are going to have eight total rows, which to some folks may seem like an overkill, but to meet our goals for agroforestry for both ecological benefit and economic benefit. Um, we have eight total rows. So within row spacing varies depending on the tree and the row, the row lengths are, are pretty um, standard depending on which part of the field we're planting in. So I'll just go through some design choices that we made um, and some reasoning behind that. So we have willow as part of this windbreak. It's the, it's the first row. And we plant a lot of willow, number one, because it's easily propagated. So we're able to source large amounts and large varieties of willow, all the way from biomass producers to you know, woody, floral perennial, uh, woody florals that you can sell to florists and, and designers. Um, same thing with the red dozier dogwood. It's also a pretty easily propagated um, thing. And these are shrubs. So we have those shrub rows. Um, next are like crab apples, which are native, but also produce really beautiful blooms in the spring. And you can cut those branches and sell those to florists as well. Um, as we go back through, we have some native shrub berries, um, American hazelnut, which is nice and shrubby, doesn't produce a huge nut, but it does produce um, you know, edible nuts. American plum and service berry and Eastern redbud, as well as persimmon, um, can all be harvested for, for edible edible use. Um, and then we go into the, the larger trees. So this is really where we're getting into that more production um, protection zone. So hybrid poplar um, is, a, is a tree we use very often because it grows incredibly fast. And I'll show a photo of how fast that grows here in a second, as well as our evergreen rows, um, and then rounding out with some native trees like pawpaw, hickory, white oak, and bur oak. Um, I am a huge fan of pawpaws. It, they grow well in a variety of situations. I know it's something that's hard um, to do up in Wisconsin. In many places, you can't grow it. Um, but our design factors within this were a demonstration. So this is going to be part of our Illinois demonstration farm program. Um, this design is CRP eligible here in Illinois. Um, and it is open enrollment right now here in Illinois. Uh, wind protection. This is a pretty windy place that's really flat on the landscape, um, drift protection from surrounding neighbors. Um, it's going to be row cropped and corn and soybean rotation, but farmed organically. So this drift protection is, is really, really important. Um, it's also next to a interstate, Interstate 57. So noise, noise protection is, is pretty important there um, and beautification as well. So we're going to be able to see this from the interstate, and it's going to be a pretty showcase um, type of planting and an option to profit after the CRP contract ends. So that's 10 years. Um, so you wouldn't be able to harvest anything from the windbreak for 10 years. But after that, we'll actually have some pretty productive trees. Um, I'm just also going to run through another example from Illinois as we wrap up. So this is Saturn Farm in Sydney. And this was planted uh, in 2015. And so those hybrid poplars that I was talking about is that um, those trees on the right. And so with, what is it now? This is going to be its fifth season in the windbreak. They have 30 to 40 feet of growth already. Um, and those trees were alternately planted. So they provide a really good screen during the, um, during the spring, summer, and fall. And then to the right on that planting, there's also two rows of evergreens that are growing a little bit slower. Um, the picture on the right is native elderberry, which, you know, form really tall, beautiful, um, bushy thickets. They also provide really great nectar for, for animals and, or, I'm sorry, for pollinators and then berries for birds in the springtime. They also grow extremely fast and um, they're really, really, really easy to maintain. Um, the one on the right is a picture of the windbreak um, in summer. We didn't do any maintenance between the rows this year um, until the end of the season because we want to protect birds um, during ground nesting season. But the rows um, of that same windbreak are we have 
Um, the outer row towards the road is blackberry and raspberry, then it's um, hazelnut, and then American plum. Uh, next rows are a mixture of elderberry and highbush cranberry. Behind that, we have persimmon and juneberry, then two rows of hybrid poplar and two rows of evergreen. And it's really hard to get a picture of all of those um, rows together. Um, the picture on the right is from last spring, um, right at the end of winter when we we're having a lot of snow melt. We had some flooding happen in the windbreak, but that flooding did not extend into the prairie and then the cropped fields um, behind it. And a lot of this water was coming off of a, a neighboring field, but we were able to trap it in the windbreak before it got to our saleable crops. So I just want to end with some photos of different ways that, that windbreaks can work. Um, to the right, a pretty typical row crop field with a, a series of trees. Um, there's only one row um, in that windbreak. Um, below is American plum that looks across from an ag field, and that's at Vulcan Farm, the one that I just talked about. Um, but there's all different ways that you can add different elements to your windbreak. So on the upper right, this is a shelter belt around a homestead where there's you know, beautiful flowers and then two rows of evergreen trees um, to protect the house from the fields on the other side, you can see even more trees in the, in the background of that. And then an example of shrubs and two evergreen rows as well. So there's lots of benefits of windbreaks um, and lots of, of, of goals that you can hit um, when you're designing and installing those. So with that, that's the end of my presentation. We'll hold questions at the end. And now I think we're going to turn it over to Andy. I right, think, thanks, thanks Katie, that's excellent. So, um, so I just kind of wanted to talk just a little bit about um, where like NRCS role um, and windbreaks and stuff. Uh, yeah, we do uh, have a flat rate, um, I think, we do both windbreak installation. We do the site prep for um, uh, site prep for windbreaks, and we also do um, let's see the site prep. The and in CSP we are also doing a renovation, and you can also plant within uh, with within existing uh, windbreaks. You can add fruit, wildlife trees, things like that, or edible type uh, species, native species. Um, the biggest thing for people from NRCS and the county is that the standard uh, for um, windbreaks is being updated. It is extremely old, and they, there's, a lot, there's been a lot of new science, a lot of new innovations within uh, the windbreak systems. A lot of it you saw during Kay's presentation, um, the way they've really broken that down. Um, so that's kind of uh, where NRCS is at, and that new standard will be coming out pretty soon. Uh, it should be more flexible with uh, newer ideas, amount of rows, species, and that kind of thing. Um, so it's going to be updated and it's going to be uh, hopefully a lot better and easier to apply on the ground. Um, did I have another slide in there? Or no? Oh, yep. Yeah. Okay, so the this is the um, from the program conservation stewardship program. Uh, it's a five-year program, but this is adding uh, food producing trees and shrubs to existing plantings. Um, next slide, please. Um, I don't think we need to really go over this. Katie had much better, and Shannon had much better pictures. But um, so yeah, this is sort of just a basic uh, you know picture of a windbreak, and then basically how it reacts towards wind. Next slide. Um, this is sort of the, uh, th these are the uh, payment scenarios, uh, and this is kind of paid by the foot. Um, I don't know that the payments have, uh, th I wouldn't count on this as being, this is what the payments are going to be the next year or whatever. Um, things change kind of quickly in NRCS, but that's just sort of a little breakdown on how it looks. Um, and next slide. I think that's it. Oh, okay, so yeah, they did a really good job of uh, really covering every every aspect of windbreaks and stuff. Uh, a lot of stuff I had never heard of. So we're working with our partners in um, Savannah Institute and uh, with Shannon's group. I forget the name. I always think that he's with uh, Central Sands, but we're trying to work to get. We haven't been doing a lot of. Uh, I think I got a, a letter 
from the national office and we have not really done any windbreaks in Wisconsin for a number of years. There's been, I think, only one that I've heard up up in Ashland. So if uh, for folks out there that want want any assistance on that through NRCS and you're wondering, um, have any questions or something, you can always contact me. Um, I think uh, talk, talk, working with um, Savannah Institute and Shannon is another great avenue. So hopefully people out there um, take advantage of our cost share for this and um, get a little bit more involved with uh, getting windbreaks out there on the ground. So if, thanks Shannon and Katie and Penny for putting this together. That's, that's all I really have. So if, unless there's any questions. Okay, we're ready for questions, everyone. So you can unmute yourself and ask questions or send them through the chat box. Just send it to everybody and we'll look at those. And while we're waiting for those to come in, um, I just wanted to mention that this is being recorded and it will be posted on the Wisconsin Land and Water website. And that this is the last of, I can't hardly believe it, we've done all eight webinars in this series. And I'm just gonna go through those. So if you haven't joined us, you can watch for these um, recordings on our website. So we did forestry and climate change. And then we did the new NRCS forestry practice scenarios, alley cropping, equip and forestry, silver pasture, CSP and forest management, wildlife and forestry, and then today's webinar. So um, thanks to Andy for coordinating all those. And we have some of those posted on our website. The other ones will be coming out. Um, are there any questions out there from anyone that you want to mute yourself or send them through the chat box? Katie here, I have a question for Shannon. Are you doing any ground prep before you lay down that fabric, the weed barrier fabric? Yeah, Katie, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, we do um, uh, some of the ground prep ourselves. Uh, some of the bigger projects that we're doing, like some of the bigger windbreaks we're doing for the farmers, we try to encourage uh, the landowner with their big equipment, their tillage equipment, whether it's discs or you know, some sort of a uh, tiller to go ahead and prep the ground before we get in there. Um, when we plant the trees, obviously you can cut through anything when we plant the trees, but with that fabric machine and how that machine works, we do have to have that ground tilled up um, for uh, the blades to be able to push the loose soil away, um, create that furrow, and then also have that loose soil to uh, to cover uh, the edges of the fabric back up afterwards. So yeah, so the ground prep is definitely necessary. Um, we've also found that it seems to uh, help increase the survival rate too, because there's less you know competition and whatnot uh, as well. And even though the fabric does kind of kill out uh, you know a lot of the weeds and everything, there's still a lot of stuff that kind of grows underneath with, with the roots. Um, so a, a good ground preparation can really uh, benefit the, the success rate and the survival rate of our uh, our, our plantings. Guess you guys did such a great job answering all everybody's questions that no one has any. So last call for questions. And again, you can I, always contact Katie and Shannon and Andy. And one thing I was gonna jump in for one second as people are wrapping up is last year, Illinois lost $33 million in, in conservation funding for, for programs through CRP. Um, such as windbreaks that weren't taken advantage of. So there's money on the table <laughs> um, and windbreaks can be a really great conservation option for folks. Right, so don't let that go to waste. Yep, and I, that's the same with um, NRCS. I think sometimes with uh, forestry in general, agroforestry specific, specifically, we are definitely um, leaving money on the table. So we'd like to get people to, um, you know, take a look at what we have going on just to help uh, start doing the, getting this out on the on the landscape. Well, great presentation. Thanks everybody. Everyone. Thanks Shannon, Katie and Andy. I appreciate it. Have a yeah. good day and great week and everyone. We're going to close her down. Thank you. Well. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good day.